All right, today's it. Today is the end. Today is the end. You could almost call it the day of the Lord. No, we won't call it the day of the Lord. But, uh, it's the end. It's, it's wrapping up. So my goal today uh, with you guys uh, is just kind of to tie up some loose ends, to put a bow on the book of Joel, to make sure you walk out of here today uh, knowing more about the book of Joel than when you walked in or maybe when you walked in five weeks ago. Um, hopefully you're already at that point. Uh, I think one of the, the best ways for, for students to show knowledge is for them to, to speak, to tell you the story, and that's how I want to start. So really the book of Joel has three chapters. Uh, I'm going to try to stay as quiet as possible at least for the first few minutes. Uh, if I would say chapter one, uh, it doesn't need to be perfect. I won't judge your answers. What's, uh, what's chapter one all about? Okay, so locust. Locust should be in your mind. Destruction. Destruction. A call to repentance. Okay, so there'll be a call to repentance for sure. Do you remember? Do you remember the things that the locusts were doing, or how the locusts were described in chapter one? They were um, they were described as an army that uh, marched in cadence. You know, they didn't uh, deviate from that cadence. Okay. And they left the. Um, they left the greenery of um, Judah. They left it in ruins. You know, they ate all the crops, and it was a. Um, they turned it into a um, barren desert. Yeah. So that's getting a little into chapter two. Chapter one is really like looking back at a at a previous plague of locusts. Chapter two is when the army is described, and then marching in cadence is described, things like that. Chapter one. One of the big takeaways of chapter one was what was the what were the responses that they were supposed to have to the locusts? Okay, yes, repent. Uh, there's the the render your heart, not your garments. But again, that's chapter two. Share this with your children. Yeah, tell your kids about this. <clears throat> tell your kids about the locusts. Let them know about how bad it is. So tell your kids, and then have some sort of action <clears throat> of uncomfortability, of putting on sackcloth and humbling yourself. So really, chapter one, if you remember that day, day one with me, trying to build up this Bible study for return to the Lord, check, day one in here was pretty miserable. Yes? Week one? Pretty depressing. Miserable. Thank you, Bob. Depressing. I, you walk out and you're ready, like, ooh, I don't know if I'm going to come back week two. There's not a lot of good news in uh, chapter one of the book of Joel. And then they were, um, the Lord uh, declared that he wanted to fast among the of Israel. Mm -hmm. And one of the phrases that we'll, we'll dig into eventually today is, at, is Joel chapter 1 verse 15 where he says alas for that day. We'll dig into that and we'll see how often that phrase is used. Uh, chapter 2 was already mentioned. Uh, locusts are back but this time presented as an army that's marching. And one of the interesting things about chapter 2 is the symmetry of that, of that chapter. The, the, it kind of leads up to rend your hearts, not your garments, which is the middle of Joel chapter 2. So destruction, 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 early chapter 2. It even says the Lord is on that side. The Lord is the head of that army. Then there's rend your hearts, not your garments. And then this restoration process that we'll look at, uh, we'll recap today a little bit, uh, kicks off where things are starting to be restored. And then chapter 3. Remember anything about chapter 3? The Lord returned uh, Judah. Uh, he returned the, uh, the gold and the, and the silver, all the precious, uh, all the pre precious uh, metals back to uh, back to the people of uh, Israel that the foreigners had stolen. Yep. And then uh, there were um, before that the um, there were there were. Um, the people of Israel, by foreigners, especially of um, Egypt, they were um, they were sold as saying, as slaves for prostitution and for wine, and and it was reversed. The uh, tables turned uh, where the foreigners now were um, the foreigners were um, sold as chattel. Yeah. In then, chapter three, right? Right, and then the Lord he, re he um, restored the um, the land to greenery where 
where there could be wine offerings in it. Uh, the vats were full of wine, and the uh, and the grain tables were full of wheat. The, uh, the tables that they crushed the grains with. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. It's almost like this restoration, right, of the Garden of Eden. So things were ruined in the first mm -hmm. chapter, ruined in chapter two. Chapter three is this restoration in, in that day of the Lord. Uh, just review with me for a minute. If I, if you read the day of the Lord in the Bible, what, what thoughts should be going through your mind? The day of the Lord is near. The day of the Lord is near. Alas, the day of the Lord is here. What, well, what's the day of the Lord? For me, I can't, I cannot be in God's presence the way I am because I'm. It sounds like a sermon I once heard, right? <laughs> oh. Oh, it, it was a deliverance. What was me? It was a deliverance of the of people on all. It could be deliverance, but the day of the Lord, Bobby, I saw your hand peek up over there. Was a day of deliverance or a day of, of judgment? Right, and you could think about many different events in the Old or New Testament as days of the Lord. One specific that I just want to make sure as we wrap up Joel today that doesn't slip your mind, I think. One of the most significant verses in the book of Joel uh, is Joel 2.28. Uh, I don't know if you have a Bible with you, but Joel 2.28 says, And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions, uh, echoes of Pentecost. But what we're going to uh, start to get into is the importance of God's presence. And when God's presence shows up, in the Old and New Testament, how how important that is, how vital that is. Uh, so there's a lot of text on the first page. Uh, last week we ended with major themes or consistent themes throughout the Bible. Uh, so if you got something to write with, uh, here are some of the things that you guys said last week, and, and I also included. One of them I just mentioned, one of the major themes in the Bible is the importance of God's presence and how God's presence shows up. So just recap with me for a minute. Give me a story in the Bible where you can clearly see God's presence. And when one could be like Isaiah 6 from the sermon today, right? Here's God's presence. Genesis. Genesis? When? Garden of Eden. Right? So the relationship between Adam and Eve and God, completely different. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Garden of Eden, right? God is walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Uh, if you watch a lot of Bible Project videos online, we'll close today with one of them. It talks about how God's space and man's space, human space, is overlapped in the Garden of Eden. Any other times that uh, God's presence shows up? I, I, I believe Isaiah chapter 9 where he says, um, where Isaiah prophesies is that there will be sent the comforter and, the, um, and, and you, there will be um, a savior that will that will have the um, crown of thorns. Okay. And that he'll, he'll die for, he'll die for um, sins. Right, there's there's names in like Emmanuel throughout the Bible, like God with us, stuff like that. But I'm, I'm thinking about when people could actually see God's presence. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, man, that's <laughs> impressive. You guys planned that out? That was, right? God's presence is there, right? And what are the what are some things the Israelites are doing? They're watching this mountain, and they're afraid. They're afraid. The mountain is shaking, right? Terrified. I think terrified. Oh. Golden calf, right? Mm -hmm. Eliza in Genesis, where um, Eliza um, he he um, he sacrifices the um, I, I believe it was the if I remember wasn't it a um, a blemish of unblemished. Um, Lamp and and a fire because he he trusted in um, he trusted in the Lord the fire was lit and there was like um, signs of thunder maybe like Elijah at Mount Carmel maybe um, let's see. give me some give me some more presence God's presence transfiguration right transfiguration Jesus is there Isaiah Noah God no. Noah. Okay. Since they got leading the Israelites just throughout the desert, he's right. always up front. Right? Pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, right? Uh, Parting of the Red Sea. Parting of the Red Sea. Uh, picture with me the Israelites walking through the Jordan River on the way to the Promised Land. Uh, what's what's leading the people? Do you remember this story? Uh, um, the 
Joshua is now the leader. Moses is gone. They're entering the promised land. The priest of the Ark. Yeah, the priest of the Ark of the Covenant. And the, the Ark, you know, a visual, you know, this is God's presence. You don't mess around in God's presence. So when I was thinking about uh, the book of Joel, I wrote this. The Lord promises to live among his people in Mount Zion. Uh, Mount Zion or Zion stands for the city of Jerusalem, the location of the temple where the holy God placed his name among the people of Israel, his holy people, who live with him there, need never fear an invasion of a foreign army, though the prophet Joel, or through the prophet Joel, the Lord is prophesying New Testament truths in terms of Old Testament history. Uh, as we wrap up today, just let that that phrasing sink in your mind. Joel is, using, is prophesying New Testament truths with Old Testament history. He's speaking not about the present earthly city of Jerusalem, but about what the Apostle Paul calls the Jerusalem that is above. As the temple, the place where God was pleased to place his name in the Old Testament times was in Jerusalem. So the Lord himself lives now among his people in the person of Jesus Christ to deliver us from every enemy, even from the, the devil and death. Here's an idea I want you to just, again, consider. In such Old Testament terms, the prophets present blessings which Jesus provides for his people in the New Testament. Even now, and those two words might be worth uh, underlining, even now, believers enjoy the forgiveness of sins, life with God, his help in every trouble. We Christians now live in that day. That's a reference to the book of Joel, Joel verse 18. And enjoy the blessings even while we still inhabit a world suffering from the pain, trouble, toil, and tears that we have, uh, that have followed the fall into sin. So, here's what I would love for us to, to think through. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, I'm going to try to make some connections for you guys today. Ezekiel uh, 48, 35. And at the very end of this book, uh, if you make it through all 48 chapters of Ezekiel, I don't know if anyone's ever tried, but Ezekiel's a fascinating book. It mentions the gates of this new city. And it's talking about uh, this Zion, or this new Jerusalem. And it says, and the name of this city from that time on, notice he doesn't call it Jerusalem or Zion, he just calls it, the Lord is there. Lord is there. I think that's an interesting way to end this book of prophecy in, in the book of Ezekiel, the importance of the presence of God, the Lord is there. So I didn't know what Pastor Zach was going to be preaching on today, but his sermon works out perfectly for me. Uh, the Lord is there. What are ways that the Lord is in, in worship today? Communion. Communion, right? And uh, I thought Pastor Zach, not just because he's in here, but I think he did a good job of uh, taking a uh, familiar story like Isaiah 6 and saying uh, there are similar pictures to, to worship today. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the the live coal that touches uh, the lips. I was thinking about like in communion, like take and eat, this is my body, give it for you. And you know, it touches our lips as well. So here am I, send me. Uh, the Lord is here, the Lord is here. What are other ways the Lord is present in, in worship? The Lord is there. Music. How? Yeah. How? How do you see that? You, you can almost feel the when, um, when the congregation sings. So it seems like there's a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Interesting. Interesting. When it talks about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Joel chapter 2, 28, I think that that's also an important picture for us to keep in the back of our minds as well today. Uh, that's the picture of the New Testament chapel or the New Testament uh, temple, it's us, right? God's people, the Spirit living in us. So we together, uh, like is described in the New Testament, are, are living stones that are built up. This, it's this interesting picture. So sometimes uh, my fear is that we just think about this stuff as like the God's presence or his Spirit being Old Testament stuff. But it's definitely here today. It's and it's not just something we we have to wait for to to be in God's presence again in uh, in heaven. Like it, it's here. So when when you think about a, a pastor turning around and saying, uh, "Forgiving us our sins," or when you receive the sacrament, or uh, you watch a kid be baptized, like these are important things. These are this is the Lord, the, the power that that shook Mount Sinai, that led the locusts through the Book of Joel, is still with us today. Uh, at the very bottom of that same page, it says, as we conclude our study of Joel, let's consider the ways that the Lord is there. 
uh, is shown throughout the Bible. We talked about that. Let's talk about it in the book of Joel. Uh, someone mentioned the army coming through. There's the Lord. He's leading the army. But listen to my question for a minute. In the book of Joel, when might people have doubted the Lord's presence? When, when uh, the locusts were coming through and they, and they were uh, eating their crops and they didn't have um, even the Levite priests, they couldn't offer uh, uh, grain and uh, grain and wine sacrifices. Right. And, and then they had to wear they had to wear the sackcloth. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm thinking about times in the Book of Joel, chapter one, where it's saying things like, "Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire and fire has destroyed or devoured the pastures in the wilderness." I think in moments like this in the book of Joel, they would look at their land and they would say, where is God? And then if you would get verses like this, be glad the people of Zion rejoice in the Lord for he has given you autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains will return or they'll be there as they were there before. It might feel like in times of blessing or prosperity that, okay, now God is here. Uh, God is there in both of these, right? Yeah. And you look at these these comparisons, and, and this is where we started on week one. You get a you get a picture like this and a picture like this, but I want you to cue into one word on Joel two twenty three, and that word is that God is what? Lord your God, Lord. Yeah, He's Lord. Absolutely, you rejoice in the Lord your God. But what is the Lord your God? How is He described in Joel two twenty three? You see a word in it? Faithful. Yeah, he's faithful, absolutely. What does that mean to you that God is faithful? Well, he keeps his word. He keeps his word, absolutely. So we don't have to fear what's coming to pass. Right. We believe in Jesus and see Jesus and what's for Jesus. Absolutely. And that reminds me of a, a previous week we were in here. We compared Joel to another minor prophet, Hosea where even though people were unfaithful, God remains faithful, and he used Hosea's life as a picture lesson. So God is faithful. How else do you see that word, God is faithful? So that's evidence of him being faithful, absolutely. But just God being a, a faithful God, let's, let's like lean into that for a minute. What does that mean? He never changes. Like Bob talk more about that. What, well, that, what always, does that mean? He's always constant all the time. You know, he answers our prayers and he's there for us. And, uh, he's, 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 he's our rush. But don't these pictures look different, Bob? It doesn't seem consistent. No, he said he would punish the wicked. And when we do wrong, he disciplines us. Okay. So we turn back to so since I only get to teach one more week, I get to ask questions like this. <laughs> so over here is the, the, the punishable. And over here is the righteous. She wants back her attention. Where do I go? You're not answering my question, Nancy. Where do I go? Nowhere. Nowhere? Man. There's a verse that kind of struck me. In the, it's, it's so, uh, Jack, are you going to avoid my question? <laughs> oh, one one uh, verse that struck me is, He that calls upon the Lord shall be saved. You know, and um, salvation, you <laughs> offer salvation to those who believe. Right. So I, I examine my own life. I can't speak for you guys. I know some of you better than others. Uh, I, I look at my life and I say, which side am I in? Am I in the punishable or am I in the righteous? righteous. Okay. Because of Jesus. Right? But I think uh, when you study a book like Joel, you, you're, you're in this side over here. And what's my only hope? Jesus. Right? This is when I think the book of Joel is so great. Is it says... Uh, rend your hearts, not your garments. This pouring out of the Spirit in my, in my life, right? That's my only hope. So, is God faithful here? Absolutely. Is God faithful here? Absolutely. But look at how the picture changes. 
it's this restoration that we're going to keep digging into. Here's another one, uh, just so you can see some contrast between in the book of Joel. Uh, we looked at this day one. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. As we read through the book of Joel, it even says, like, your joy is dried up. And then in Joel chapter 2, after the rend your hearts, not your garments, the threshing floors will be filled with grain, the vats overflowing with new wine uh, and oil. And these pictures are not just Joel-specific pictures. It's why I said week one, week two, a book like Joel, in my mind, and you can disagree with me, that's okay. It's the last time I'm teaching this, the book of Joel. Is, I think the book of Joel is a, a key to help us unlock sections of the Bible. So just go to familiar passages uh, like Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in new pastures and all of that. And then it describes your cup, and it describes your cup as what? Overflowing. And that's not because uh, anything we have done. It's a similar uh, idea. And I'm not saying that this is a parallel to Psalm 23, but these similar themes tend to run throughout the, uh, the Old and New Testament. So as we take a step back for the last time, if you flip a page to page 2, let's take a look at the full picture. Joel chapter 115 has a phrase, alas for that day, alas for the day of the Lord. It's a cry uh, of someone who is experiencing a terrible loss. I want to show you it's not just uh, Joel. Joshua, after the battle of Ai, after they get wiped out, the battle of Ai, for reference, is right after the battle of Jericho. Joshua begins his prayer to the Lord with the same words when his people have been defeated at Ai. In Joshua 7, uh, he says, Alas, and he says, Alas, why did you bring these people across the Jordan River? And this is when God and Joshua are having a conversation. This is when they narrow it down, if you know it's the story of Achan. Uh, but there's that similar word. Even Ezekiel says these same words when the Lord shows him the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, Alas, are you going to, to uh, destroy the entire remnant? Like, God, you've kept your promises. Are you going to destroy everyone? And even like this morning, as I was uh, getting ready for today, I was just reading a, a few sections of the book of Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah's calling, because that was interesting to me because of Isaiah 6. And when Jeremiah is called in Jeremiah chapter 1, you can fact check me, you can look it up. Jeremiah is a young guy, and God says, you're going to be my prophet. And what Jeremiah says is, alas, I am too young. It's kind of this interesting phrase that says, if you're experiencing a terrible loss or you're seeing something that your, your eyes and your mind are confused, like, where is God in this moment? How could God do this? Will God work through trouble? Will God work through me? This phrasing gets used throughout the uh, Old and New Testament. So, I think we've, we've hit this point pretty hard over the last four weeks, but... Why alas in the book of Joel or in Joel chapter 1? Because we're being punished by God and we have no defense against that. Right. Everything is ruined. Right? Everything is ruined. The locusts have come through. What one army of locusts has left, the next one has destroyed. So alas, you sit in Joel chapter 1 and you weep with the people of Israel. Everything is gone. Even people's identity, we said, in week one is gone. The priests can no longer offer their sacrifices. The farmers can't farm. Even the cattle is crying out. You can't be who you are. Your joy is gone. So, in Joel chapter one, if you want a, a word to describe it, it's a lapse. It's a cry. It's a cry out. It's a cry that we need to teach our kids. That's what Joel would say. Bob, you want to say something? Okay. Chapter 2, rend your hearts. Joel would tear down our religious defenses. We talked about this for a while, but let the law of your holy God humble your pride. Let him lead you to contrition, even though your broken heart may hurt. Instead of singing praise or psalms and thanksgiving and praise, we approach the altar to pray with tears of repentance. Uh, that phrase, phrasing in Joel chapter 2 that said that you're walking towards the altar. Their prayer has echoes of Moses' prayer in Exodus 32. Why should the Egyptians say it is with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Here's Moses 
Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in our lives, we are not presumptuous. We do not dictate to the Lord what his answer should be. Yet because of the Lord's promises, we pray boldly. Now, here's something I do with my juniors a lot. I'm going to see how it works with you guys. Uh, we're just going to take a minute. I want you to write a, a Joel prayer. Uh, I have no expectation of what you write. Um, but if you were going to write a Joel prayer, what would, it, what would it sound like? So I'm going to give you a few minutes just to ponder where we've been over the last four weeks and write a prayer with themes from the book of Joel. And then maybe a couple of you will be bold enough to read what you wrote. My blank is empty, so I'm really relying on you guys. Revelation is on the page eventually, 
but also it's consistent again, and that's my word for today, consistent throughout uh, the entire Bible. So I just was, you know, looking at tech times in the Bible where it sounds to me like Joel is paging through, uh, like Isaiah 32, as he's uh, thinking about his book, as he's thinking about this prophecy, as uh, he's writing through the Holy Spirit, and it says, the fortress will be abandoned. The noisy city deserted, and this picture is of destruction. The citadel and watchtower will be become a wasteland forever. The the light of donkeys and the pasture of flocks till until the spirit is poured out on us from on high, and the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field seems like forest. In, in just two verses in the middle of Isaiah's book. Uh, 66 chapters long, here's this picture of destruction, and here's this picture of things restored, and it says, and it will happen when the Spirit is poured out on us from on high. A similar idea, similar picture uh, to a book like Joel. Or in the very last chapter of the Bible, like it says on your page, John tells us what we are hoping and what we are waiting for. Now the dwelling of God is with his people. He will live with them forever. There is God's presence, right? He will live with them forever. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So as we focus on this next phrase a lot, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or pain or crying. For here's the phrase I want you to consider maybe today. The old order of things has passed away. Now, as we pause on that, the old order of things has passed away, I think it's good to just pause Think through the book of Joel, think through the Old Testament and the New Testament of, of what John is saying here, the old order of things has passed away. So again, someone said the Garden of Eden earlier today. The Garden of Eden is this place of, of unity and perfect harmony between God and his people, God's presence right there with uh, Adam and Eve, this perfect harmony. Now, like Pastor Zach said in his sermon today, there are times in in our, our life today, there's an overlap of of, I'll say, God's space and our space through things like communion, like he'll preach about today. But that old order of things as mentioned in Revelation, the, the old order of the corruption of sin, the, the world that we live in today passed away, and it says that is gone, and now this new order is here. So when you, when you think about the end of the world, when you think about heaven, when you think about new heavens and new earth, I think a book like Joel helps me understand that even better. And I think about this restoration, this new Eden that is described in the book of book of Joel. So I think about forever in heaven, God's with me, God's presence is with me, God's space and our space, once again, similar to, to the Garden of Eden. And as you read through the book of Joel, or as you dig into the Bible and you study things like the temple, how it, was, um, how it was built and stuff like this, you get these pictures of this restoration of the Garden of Eden that is so good that I think when you just read through books like Joel, it just, it just pops off the page. Um, the day of the Lord, last thing there, the, the book of Joel preaches the same message as something that we have right now and waiting for, we wait for and hope. So when you think about the day of the Lord, here's how I want to end it. If you got a Bible, could you turn to Ezekiel 36, 24 to 38? We'll revisit it in Ezekiel. We'll see how it maybe matches with the book of Joel. And then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the book of Joel with a summary. Ezekiel 36. As you're turning there, any questions on Joel? Or comments? All right, Ezekiel 36, 24 to 38. Um, my reason in doing this longer section of scripture, these 15 or so verses, is as it's being read or as you're listening, think about how a book like Joel might help unlock the middle of, or near the middle of Ezekiel, just a, a book of the Bible. So anyone want to read maybe a paragraph or a few verses or... Gene, can you take maybe 26 or 24 to 32? Perfect. Jeff, you want to take 33 to 36? And then 
Anyone take the last two, 37, 38? Nancy, thank you. Go for it, Gene. For I will take you out of the nation. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you, I want you to know that I'm not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct to the house of Israel. This is, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, the, um, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in the ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you will remain. You will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This Oops. is what the sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to Israel's plea and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as a flock, for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed festivals. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Instead of me telling you my takeaways, what, what do you take away from what was just written? Any phrases or ideas stand out to you? The Lord's going to re uh, restore the um, what's been destroyed, the desolate deserts and that, the barren deserts. He'll restore it to greenery. Are we sure? Yeah. How, how are we sure that he's going to do it? He's faithful. Right. I am the Lord, and I will do this. Uh, sometimes I think we need to like read those with like extra emphasis. Like, I will do this. And it, you can almost like envision the people, and they're like, yeah, okay. Like, it's not because of anything they're, they're, they've done. Yeah, going off of that, um, verse 32, so he's talking about, all of those things he's going to do, but then 32 is, well, it's not because you did anything good to, to deserve this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of jumped out, like all these good things, and then it was like, well, shame on you. Right. I want to do this because you're so great. I'm not doing this because you're great. Right. And it almost has, like, tones of, and as you look at all the good stuff I give you, just realize that it's not because of it. Like, just be ashamed that it's crazy, so thank you. Yeah. It's the same, same thing I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Great what else stands out to you, Pastor? The thing that stands out to me about, you know, Joel and Ezekiel, and I, we we're just talking about it a little bit, but they're not going to see what God says He's going to do. And, and yes, God says He's going to do it. <laughs> Um, but they're never going to see it. They're never going to see wine, vines overflowing with grapes 
and fields overflowing with harvests and olive oil. And uh, I think that's important for us is because when we look around <laughs> and we look at our, ourselves and our world, what we see mm -hmm. looks very different from what God says he is doing right now and will do one day. I was looking at Habakkuk, which fits together with all this stuff. And at the very end, he says, even if the fig tree does not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vines, if the yield of olive fails and the fields produce no food, even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And uh, that's the difference between walking by faith and by sight. Um, don't let your eyes deceive you. But, uh, yeah. Open, your, open up your ears. Interesting. That's at the end of Habakkuk. Yeah. In the beginning of Habakkuk, Habakkuk is asking God a lot of questions. Uh, like, how long will you let my enemies succeed? Know, how long will you kind of turn a blind eye to everything that they're doing? I'm weak. They look strong. What are you doing? So that's interesting that he ends it that way. Thanks for bringing that up. It's almost like with the, the comparison picture, like God is faithful in both of those. In the eyes of faith, you look at the desolate fields. That's, that's and, great. And tying back into the, the sacrament. Yeah. Right? Like it's just so easy with our eyes to, to say, well, you know, there's nothing real great going on. I mean, this is a this is an, actually a divine appearance among us, <laughs> and it is. Yeah. If you believe the words, this is my body, and this is my blood given for you, like this is, heaven has just come down to earth. Don't be afraid to talk after Pastor Zod talks. What else did you guys take from uh, <laughs> What else did you take from Ezekiel? You're like, that's, that's what I think. No. What else from Ezekiel, anything you take away from what was, what was read? Well, that's Thank you. what Pastor Zapp was talking about it reminds me of he did reward Moses. Moses saw all the bad and then he was going to die, but God took him up on the mountain to see the promised land. He actually saw it. Mm -hmm. yes. So he was rewarded to see it. Yeah. And it's not even the, the best final land. When you saw the promised land. Thank you. I, I never thought that was significant, but now when Pastor Zach said that, we're yeah, not going to see it. Yeah, he's a great teacher. Zach's a great teacher. Love teacher. He's a good teacher. Oh, yes, amen. Go for it. The, the art just restored physically and spiritually also. Yeah, restored spiritually. God says, well, we should learn that even though we may have hard times. God is there for us, and we will eventually have good times and great times and we'll eventually go to heaven. You know, it will be wonderful. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's how that section ends. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Uh, to wrap, to start wrapping up Joel, uh, and it's kind of like a fat question, but then you remember what Joel's name means. You all, some of you have phones, you look it up. Um, Joel's name means the Lord is God, right? The Lord is God. And uh, the Lord is God, that's what Joel means. So as I was thinking about how to wrap this whole thing up, um, you know, I was trying to think about like this clever, slightly humorous way of wrapping it up. But I think like just remembering Joel's name helps us understand like the Lord is God. And it's kind of ties in with what Pastor Zach was saying uh, slightly, is that you read chapter 1, and it's easy to read chapter 1 and to leave thinking, man, that's depressing. But the Lord is God. The Lord is God. He's the God who still gets the last word. He's the God who, who gets the final say. Uh, the Lord is God. He's in God in chapter 2 on both sides of that, that journey towards rend your hearts, not your garments. He's there. The Lord is God leading the army of locusts, and he is there restoring. 
the day of the Lord, chapter 3, the Lord is still God in the valley of judgments. He is the guy who gets the last word. But the familiar phrase that gets repeated in Joel that was said first in Exodus also describes the Lord, the Lord who is God. So you can't leave today without remembering that the Lord is God, is the Lord who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in, in faithful love. That's the God that's described in the book of Joel. And you get that phrase right in the middle of desolation from locusts and this restoration of, of the Garden of Eden. The Lord is still the Lord. He is The Lord is God. So if you're trying to think through what the book of Joel is all about, think through the locusts, yes. Think through, rend your hearts, or return to the Lord. But it's all about the Lord who is still God, who gets the last word, who is still gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Uh, to wrap up, uh, before I say thank you for allowing me to teach you guys for five weeks, uh, I showed you guys a, a summary video on Joel, but my... My, my computer died the last time I showed it to you, so I want to show it to you again. Uh, what you're going to see at the end of the video, or as it's going through, is don't flash this up, you'll see him drawn through. I just wanted to, and I know it's tough to see, but sometimes I think like you watch a Bible project video and you get to the end and you're like, holy cow, what did I just witness? So I'm just going to kind of give you like the two second or 30 seconds uh, summary of what he's going to walk you through. He's going to talk about Joel and how Joel. Uh, talks about destruction, even though no specific sin is mentioned. Then he's going to talk about the parallels between chapter 1 and chapter 2, with the locusts and the call to repentance and the action. But really pay attention to at the end, as he's talking about the restored new Eden, and how he fits it all together by saying, there's a theme here, he's going to circle it in red, there's a theme here, and there's a theme here. So watch for those themes, okay? So, watch the video. And then I'll say thank you, and it'll be good for uh, the day. Hopefully, the volume is not too loud. Isaiah, can you do an old man a favor and turn the lights on? <laughs> for a few reasons. First of all, there's no explicit indication of when this book was written. It's most likely the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile, because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin, but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings, and his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedies of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme in the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophets saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations, and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here, in chapters 1 and 2, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter 1 is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time the locusts are being sent against Israel. And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer. And then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. 
And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts. But he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes. And Joel says, the day of the Lord is dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how? To rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your God. In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent. Because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoted here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so, he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts, and we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment, and that with the God of mercy there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, that God's Spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they can truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah, and Zephaniah, and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess it, and about how all of that leads us to hope that God will one day defeat evil in our world, but also inside of us, and bring his healing presence to make all things new. And that's what the book of Joel is all about. All right, quiz next week. <laughs> so hopefully that summarizes it. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the, the class with me. Uh, thank you for allowing me to teach you guys for the last five weeks. Why don't we close?